a fruit larger than a mango, sweeter than a banana, growing wild across half of America. Yet it does not exist in a single grocery store. The pawpaw is North America's largest native fruit, producing custard-like flesh that indigenous peoples harvested for over 10,000 years. Early settlers called it the poor man's banana because it offered tropical abundance without tropical imports. Lewis and Clark survived on pawpaws when their expedition ran out of food in 1810. Thomas Jefferson cultivated them at Monticello. George Washington ate them cold as dessert. Then, somewhere between the forest and the supermarket, this fruit vanished from American consciousness. The industrial food system demanded fruits that could survive a 2,000-mile journey in a refrigerated truck. The pawpaw ripens within 48 hours of harvest, bruises at the slightest touch, and turns black within three days. It offered only flavor, nutrition, and the radical idea that food could taste extraordinary without genetic modification. The system could not profit from something that refused to be commodified. A simina triloba belongs to a tropical family called Ananaceae, the same lineage as Cherimoya and Soursop. Yet this tree thrives in Kentucky winters, where temperatures drop to 25 Vidagif. It is the only temperate member of an otherwise tropical family, a botanical anomaly that produces mango-flavored fruit in Ohio. The pawpaw evolved alongside megafauna like mastodons and giant ground sloths, which dispersed its large seeds across the continent. When these animals went extinct 10,000 years ago, indigenous peoples became the primary seed dispersers. The fruit produces compounds called acetogenins, natural pesticides so effective that no commercial insect attacks the tree. Farmers today spray pawpaw extract on other crops as organic pest control. The tree requires no fertilizers, no fungicides, no herbicides. It grows in forest understory, tolerating 70% shade. It fixes nitrogen through mycorrhizal partnerships, enriching soil instead of depleting it. Modern agriculture demands crops that require constant chemical intervention to survive. The pawpaw demonstrates that nature's design already perfected what laboratories struggle to achieve. This was not a failure of domestication. It was a refusal to participate in an extractive system. The flesh tastes like mango blended with banana, with undertones of pineapple and vanilla custard. But describing pawpaw flavor in terms of other fruits is like describing Mozart in terms of elevator music. The texture is custard smooth, neither stringy like mango nor mealy like overripe banana. When perfectly ripe, the fruit yields to gentle pressure like a ripe avocado. The aroma fills a room within minutes, a perfume so intense that a single fruit scents an entire kitchen. Indigenous Shawnee and Cherokee nations timed autumn gatherings around pawpaw harvests. They ate them fresh, dried the pulp into cakes for winter storage, and fermented them into ceremonial beverages. Early American settlers made pawpaw bread, pawpaw custard, and pawpaw beer. Recipes from the 1700s describe pawpaw cream as superior to the finest European desserts. Then industrialization demanded uniformity of flavor. The modern food system trained consumers to expect predictable blandness, red delicious apples, seedless watermelons, California strawberries bred for shelf life rather than taste. A fruit with complex variable flavor became incompatible with mass production. The distinction was never about quality, it was about control and profit margins. A 100-gram serving of pawpaw contains more vitamin C than an orange, more potassium than a banana, and more magnesium than an avocado. The fruit delivers 80 calories, 18 grams of natural sugars, and 2.6 grams of protein. It contains all nine essential amino acids, making it one of the few fruits with complete protein profiles. The acetogenin compounds that protect the tree from pests also demonstrate anti-cancer properties in laboratory studies. Research from Purdue University shows pawpaw extracts selectively target tumor cells while leaving healthy cells untouched. McLaughlin et al. published findings in 1997 showing acetogenins suppress ATP production in cancer mitochondria. Compare this to the average supermarket banana. 
89 calories, zero protein, and nutrients bred out through decades of Cavendish monoculture. The modern apple contains 100 times less phytonutrient density than wild ancestors. We traded nutrient-dense forest foods for convenient empty calories. The pawpaw survives in the wild, still producing its acetogenin-rich fruit, still offering free nutrition to anyone willing to forage. But 99% of Americans have never tasted it. This was not an accident of history. It was an economic strategy. The pawpaw's commercial death sentence was written in 1950s shipping infrastructure. The United Fruit Company pioneered refrigerated transport for bananas, picked green, and ripened with ethylene gas. This model required fruits that could survive mechanical harvesting, chemical ripening, and transcontinental shipping. The pawpaw ripens on the tree and must be eaten within 72 hours. It bruises if you look at it wrong. It cannot be picked by machine. It cannot be stored in warehouses. It cannot survive the supply chain that makes bananas cost 49 cents per pound. Agricultural economists called it commercially non-viable. But commercially non-viable simply means it cannot generate shareholder value for multinational distributors. The fruit remains biologically superior, nutritionally exceptional, and agriculturally sustainable. It simply refuses to make distant corporations wealthy. So industrial agriculture erased it from nurseries, seed catalogs, and agricultural extension programs. By 1980, most Americans under 40 had never heard of their continent's largest native fruit. Before highways and supermarkets, America had a pawpaw infrastructure. Towns across Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois hosted annual pawpaw festivals. Farmers sold fruit at roadside stands. Railroads transported pawpaws in ice-packed crates to eastern cities. The 1916 Farmer's Bulletin, Suckskins 85, listed pawpaw as a recommended commercial crop. By 1960, those bulletins were out of print. The festivals disappeared. The orchards were bulldozed for suburban developments. Agricultural universities stopped teaching pawpaw cultivation. Within one generation, 150 years of accumulated cultivation knowledge vanished. The few remaining pawpaw experts were hobbyists and foragers preserving seeds in their backyards. This erasure was systematic. It required suppressing information, discontinuing research, and replacing regional food systems with centralized distribution. The strategy succeeded so completely that modern Americans believe bananas are normal and pawpaws are exotic. The pawpaw tree does not grow alone. Its roots form partnerships with soil fungi, creating mycorrhizal networks that share nutrients across dozens of trees. These networks cannot be replicated in sterile nursery conditions. Commercial horticulture demands bare root transplants that survive shipping in plastic bags. Pawpaw seedlings die without their fungal partners. This biological requirement made mass propagation nearly impossible until the 1990s. Modern tissue culture techniques finally enabled commercial propagation, but by then, consumer demand had been erased. The tree requires three to seven years to produce fruit from seed. Industrial orchards demand crops that fruit within 18 months. The pawpaw operates on forest time, not factory time. It prioritizes long-term soil health over short-term yields. It builds ecosystems instead of extracting resources. These characteristics made it worthless to an economic system that measures success in quarterly profit reports. Growing pawpaws requires abandoning industrial gardening logic. Plant two or more trees for cross-pollination as pawpaws are self-incompatible. They prefer rich, slightly acidic soil with pH 5.5, 7.0, mimicking forest floor conditions. Young trees need 70% shade for the first two years, then full sun for fruiting. Water deeply during establishment, but never waterlog roots. The trees fruit in late August through October, depending on latitude. Harvest when fruit yields to gentle pressure, not before. A ripe pawpaw releases easily from the stem with a slight twist. Eat within three days or freeze the pulp for later use. The fruit cannot be canned or dehydrated without losing its texture. This preservation difficulty is precisely why it never entered commercial channels. 
but freezing pawpaw pulp maintains flavor and nutrition for up to a year. One mature tree produces 30-50 pounds of fruit annually with zero chemical inputs. This yield translates to $150, $250 worth of tropical flavored fruit from a tree that requires no maintenance beyond watering during drought. The pawpaw represents an alternative economic model based on abundance rather than scarcity. Industrial agriculture creates artificial scarcity to maintain high prices. Seedless fruits force consumers to buy new plants annually. Patented GMO crops criminalize seed saving. The pawpaw produces viable seeds in every fruit, allowing infinite propagation. It thrives without patents, without corporate ownership, without licensing fees. Anyone with soil and patience can grow tropical fruit in temperate climates. This accessibility terrifies a food system built on dependency. The Green Revolution promised to feed the world through chemical agriculture. Instead, it created markets for fertilizer, pesticide, and seed companies. The pawpaw fed indigenous nations for 10,000 years without requiring any external inputs. Modern food insecurity is not a failure of nature. It is a success of centralized control. Every pawpaw tree planted is an act of economic descent. The pawpaw is experiencing a quiet renaissance among permaculture enthusiasts, forest gardeners, and food sovereignty activists. Kentucky State University maintains the National Clonal Germplasm Repository with over 45 pawpaw varieties. Breeders have developed cultivars like Sunflower, Susquehanna, and Shenandoah with improved flavor and larger fruit size. The Ohio Pawpaw Festival attracts 10,000 visitors annually to Athens County. Small-scale farmers are establishing pawpaw orchards in Appalachia, the Ozarks, and the Pacific Northwest. Chefs in cities like Asheville, Louisville, and Portland feature pawpaw in seasonal menus. The fruit commands $8.15 per pound at farmers' markets. This price reflects true cost of labor-intensive harvest, not artificial scarcity. Young farmers are planting pawpaws on marginal land, unsuitable for conventional crops. The tree stabilizes soil on slopes, prevents erosion, and creates wildlife habitat. Deer avoid browsing pawpaw due to acetogenin content in leaves. This makes it ideal for reforestation in areas with overpopulated deer herds. The restoration is happening without government subsidies, without corporate backing, without marketing campaigns. It spreads through seed sharing, festival tastings, and word of mouth. Every generation inherits a food system and chooses whether to accept or transform it. Our great-grandparents ate pawpaws as casually as we eat apples. Our grandparents watched them disappear. Our parents never learned they existed. We have the choice to restore what was deliberately erased. The knowledge is not lost. It is dormant, waiting in old seed banks and aging orchards. The trees still grow wild in river valleys from Nebraska to Florida. The fruit still ripens every September. The flavor still surpasses anything in a grocery store. Reclaiming this food is not nostalgia. It is resistance. It is choosing flavor over convenience, autonomy over dependency, forests over factories. Plant a pawpaw tree and you plant a 50-year rebellion against the system that erased it. The pawpaw never needed us. We needed the pawpaw. It survived extinction of the megafauna, colonization of the continent, industrialization of agriculture, and a century of deliberate suppression. It grows in forest understory today exactly as it did 10,000 years ago. The question is not whether the pawpaw can survive without industrial support. The question is whether we can rediscover food systems that do not require corporate mediation. Start by finding a pawpaw patch near you or plant two trees this fall. Join the quiet revolution of those choosing flavor, nutrition, and autonomy over convenience and control.